Three, two, one, go. This week, we talk wireless security with Rick Farina from Pony Express. We'll not ask him about trolling Ubuntu users, or maybe we will. Stories of the week, we'll talk about hacking cars and sucking at security. All that and more, so stay tuned. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady, it's Paul's Security Weekly. This episode is sponsored by NetSparker, the developers of the only false positive free web application security scanners, enabling you to automatically identify vulnerabilities and security flaws in all your websites, web applications, and web services. NetSparker scanners are available in two editions, NetSparker Desktop and NetSparker Cloud, the enterprise-level online scanning service. For more information, visit netsparker.com forward slash security weekly. And by Pony Express, check out the Community Edition and turn your Nexus 7 into a lean and mean pen testing machine. For all those hard to reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at PonyExpress.com. And by Onapsis, the leading provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SAP and Oracle business critical platforms from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud risks. Visit them on the web at Onapsis.com. Welcome, everyone, to this edition of Security Weekly. I'm your host, a man who changes your paradigm with glitter, apparently. Just sprinkle sprinkle some glitter. Make it rain. Make it rain. Make it rain. I need some actual glitter. Where are my props? I'm going to take these... Gla- if I take these glasses off, it's like really bright. Yeah. Let me get these back to Rick. Uh, thank you for allowing me to wear them. Uh, this is episode 424 for June 25th, 2015. I've got lots of special guests here in the studio. To my, to my left, Rick Farina's here. We're going to get to Rick in just a few. Not Kevin here in studio. Whoa. Welcome, Not Kevin. Hey, thank you. Mr. Jack Daniel, all the way over there. Welcome, Jack. For Thank Great. you for mixing some fabulous, fabulous. Yeah, what do you call this one, Jack? We're starting off with a Pim's Cup, classic uh, summer drink. Mm. In, in mm. Mm. It's, uh, it's uh, not very strong, but it's a nice, uh, refreshing drink to start the evening before we it's start very knocking refreshing. back the hard it's stuff. It's next <laughs> generation. There's some... Uh, <laughs> It's Cyber APD Next Generation Cocktail. <laughs> On the lines via Skype, we've got Mr. Carlos Perez. Welcome, Carlos. Hey, Paul. Happy to be here. In the middle, we've got Mr. Michael Santarcangelo. Welcome, Mike. <laughs> Gee, I feel like the Brady Bunch. That's right. <laughs> it's, it does, it's very Brady Bunch. Marsha, like. Marsha, yeah. Marsha. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's Joff. All the way to the right, we've got Mr. Joff Thire. Welcome, Joff. G'day, Paul. How are you? I, you know, when you introed, I thought you said that we were going to be hacking at security and sucking computer gas tanks or something. Anyway, <laughs> how are you? Something like that. We're having a discussion before the show how when they deliver beer, they deliver it like oil except it's beer. Where is that in Europe, Jack? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just you, were, you see it there around Europe. I remember in Amsterdam with the, the tiny streets. They don't even pull. There are no alleys to pull into, so they just like stop in front of the bar and drag the giant hoses in, and it looks like they're filling the oil tanks. But it's you know the the brewery trucks it's filling the, the filling the casks in the uh, in the basement. <coughs> awesome! I need one of those to stop at my house. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just, just we need one here at the studio. Um, ready to learn combat firmware analysis? That's right. Register for my Black Hat course. Embedded device security assessments for the rest of us. A two-day class hosted at Black Hat Las Vegas. Registration includes breakfast, lunch, and access to the Black Hat briefings, uh, business hall, sponsor workshops, and sponsor sessions, and arsenal talks. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash IOT to register today. It's going to be fun. In fact, my uh, courseware is due tomorrow. Tomorrow. We've got a lot of fun stuff. You should start tomorrow, then. I should probably get started on the courseware. <laughs> Yeah, it's debatable. <laughs> Thank you for Sleep not being one important. of those people who's like, it's due tomorrow, so I can start tomorrow after lunch. That's right. Be, yeah, I can. Great. Totally. I mean, I got till midnight, right? When you call it combat firmware analysis, I, I in, envision everybody showing up in like karate gis and you give them belts. Like, do you have to be like a yellow belt to well, attend? No. Uh, no. <laughs> and we, maybe we'll have some martial arts, demo- martial arts even demonstrations <laughs> during the class. But it's all about. So you've come across. Spell it correctly, because nobody in the uh, in the class wants to see you give demonstrations of marital arts. Yes. Oh. No, don't, I remember don't, that last time. Uh, 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 don't take advice from me on that front. 
Um, so, but anyway, you come across an embedded device on your penetration test, and you want to analyze the security of that. How do you do it? So, like, you're in combat, and you want to analyze the So you kick it, like Karate Kid. Well, you, you could throw it. End map yeah. it. There's a whole, whole yeah, you could just end map it or NASA scan it, and it'll be fine. We cover that in the class, how to do those things appropriately. But more in-depth into analyzing the firmware. And in this instance of the class, there will be an introduction to our latest project, which I can actually start talking about a little bit, which is IVWIRT, Intentionally Vulnerable Open Wirt Firmware ah, Distribution, nice. which uh, myself and uh, Nick Curran have been working on feverishly. And uh, inside the class, we have all kinds of demos. It's really cool. We'll take you. The one that worked is really cool is we take you from like authentication bypass to C surf to command injection to malware on the system. So we actually started stringing together the vulnerabilities. Oh, that's awesome. To do cool stuff. So you'll really have cool. the first copies of that in the class when you register for it and, and come to the class. So, so um, in the 700 series class, you have IV Nest. Yes, yeah. <laughs> well, we talk about Nest a little bit. Uh, it's kind of interesting. There's people that are hacking Nest, but it, require, <coughs> it requires physical access to the Nest. And my joke you is always... You Nest? I, I stole it from, from Jericho, I think, that said, like, if I'm going to break into your house to hack into your Nest, I'm probably just going to snuff you out with your pillow <laughs> rather than just, like, make it really hot in your house, which is really what you <laughs> can I'll do show with you. Nest. <laughs> oh, are you getting the new Nest? Uh, I saw an email about the new Nest, Carlos. What is the new, new Nest? Uh, the, supposedly smaller and smarter, and there's also a new drop cam. Yes. Now it's the Nest Cam. I saw the, the Nest Cam. Uh, I saw they were trying to sell me more smoke detectors, which are ridiculously expensive. Uh, oh, yeah. I don't, how are they going to make the new Nest smarter? Ah, I don't so. <laughs> Big they're data. Using their own That's always the answer. Protocols. I think they removed the secret Threat intelligence. Off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this time they're using SSL. The big data and threat <laughs> intelligence. It shifts the paradigm of the way that you maintain your house. You guys must all work <laughs> in marketing. <laughs> <laughs> no, wow. so uh, I find that the, is full of it. <laughs> do you run the nest in like learning mode, so it automatically adjusts your temperature? I've not. I've never talked to someone who said, "Oh, that went really well." Like if I was, like, <laughs> I enabled that, so Nest is supposed to learn like my behaviors and adjust accordingly. And like. I walk in my house one day and it's freezing, and I walk in my house the next day and it's hotter than a, a horn church. Is that inappropriate? In my analogy? case, I don't need it. No, the, not really. No. We don't get <laughs> snow over here. <laughs> That's not PC. That's not very PC. It's not very Kevin. PCI. Yeah. What was that, Carlos? I it, don't need it. We don't get snow over here. Yeah, we know. <laughs> you get hurricanes, though, or something. Only every eight years, eight to ten years. Well, we, we hate you. So, uh, <laughs> no, uh -oh. I'm just kidding. We're, we love you, Carlos. We're losing the feed, Carlos. You sound awful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think he's having a provider problem. I think so. Long wind blowing by. Uh, probably, uh, uh, probably one of my daughters left the Roku running and the other one the Apple TV. <laughs> that happens. Wouldn't um, be surprised. Mr. Rick Farina has joined us in studio. Again, he's the gentleman to my left in the sunglasses. Sorry. Also known as Zero Chaos. Now, it's interesting. Um, Rick and I met, with, or uh, I said like the early days of cons, right? Keep, keep going. I we, like where this is going. Yeah. When Rick, we need like, like loving sex music or something. When Rick and I first met. Wow. Uh, about wow. Jake wow. <laughs> No, it's not <laughs> like that. <laughs> Uh, we met at first. Shmoocon. Was it Shmoocon? I think we yeah. first met at yeah, Shmoocon. Shmoocon. Yeah. I think you actually listened to the show back then as well. I did. Yeah. And I, I still hang out in your IRC channel that, that I'm still no waiting for you to anyone. hang out in. But. <laughs> He's like, oh, I'm Zero Chaos in the IRC channel. I'm like, that's awesome. So <laughs> Rick and I have known each other since then. Uh, we've, done, uh, we've been doing wireless like research, basically, uh, not together, but at the same time. Yep. Um, so we always had a lot in common with wireless and drinking and random escapades at Shmoocon. <laughs> It's been great. Oh, and then bad things. You recently <laughs> got a uh, position. Uh, I almost called it a promotion. I guess it would be. No, no de definitely. It, it, was, it, was, it was both. It was a, a lateral was, promotion. A lateral promotion. Uh, to the director of engineering for Pony Labs at oh, Pony oh, Express. Oh, hold on, man. Nope. It, you're like the third person that's done that. And I tell you what, the, the director of engineering is going to kill me this time. He swore next time he would kill me. Director of research and development. Director. Well, see, my, I just read what... I just read what's on the teleprompter. <laughs> man, Whatever that, is that, on the teleprompter, Paul does research read. for this show? <laughs> Um, our director of engineering does research. <laughs> 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 Apparently, <laughs> so you are the director of research 
Engineering? Research and development. Research and development. Okay. Yep. An engineer. No. Just so a director. So that makes you like you're a security researcher. I, I am actually a security researcher that gets to implement what he researches sometimes. So it's yeah. a lot of fun. <laughs> well, yeah. when, I, when I heard you had accepted the position, I thought that's perfect for Rick. Now it's happy for everyone. And now you're here on the show. How did you get your start in information security? Oh, gosh. Well, there's, there's a lot of answers to that question. It depends if you want to go back to when I got thrown out of school for taking over the district's computer network. I mean, that was kind of information security, but it might have been on the wrong side. Then I, People uh, get thrown in jail for that now. I was just going to say, do, actually, how the yeah, world I'm, has changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there are a few gray hairs, so I'm old enough to have gotten away with that. Um, <laughs> then, then I went to the university and, and took over their computer network. So I've just always had a, a firm interest, I think, in, in security in general because you know, it's, just, it's fun to take things apart and see how they work. And occasionally when you do that with a multi-million dollar network, people get upset. But you know, I, I, now I'm doing the exact same thing, except they're paying me to do it instead of throwing me out, so it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, what, now, what did you do before Pony Express? You were uh, with another company, obviously. Yeah, so before Pony Express, I was with Airtight Networks. We did uh, wireless intrusion detection and prevention, yep. and I was actually there you for did that eight for a years. While. Yeah. yeah, I was there okay. for eight years. Uh, that, was, uh, that was actually my first real job, so like, I, had, I worked in a small town. I yeah. lived in a small town in Ohio, and uh, I couldn't find anything in town that was willing to actually put me to work at a decent mm -hmm. like, something, so I gave up and started my own business. And so me and, like, three friends ran a, a networking company, mm -hmm. and we did, you know, all your boring stuff. And then, then I decided to leave because I, I hated that city, and I, I met up with Airtight and got my first real job in information security. And, uh, yeah, I, I yeah, rolled that I, for a long time. I was talking about it with Mike. It was, like, at a time when wireless security was at, I mean, it was at its peak. I mean, Absolutely. before 2005, there were people doing wireless research, and everyone yeah. was, like, everyone in the general media and population was, like, uh, that's we think wireless networks are cool because we don't need wires anymore. So security people shut up so we can use this because it's awesome. And we were, right. like, no, no, no. Yeah. This, and even some of the first wireless uh, hacking kits, if you will, cost tens of thousands of dollars. To be able oh, yeah. to do 802.11 uh, kind of research, you needed some really expensive equipment. That yep. pretty quickly changed. And like in 05, when, when did you start at Airtight? Probably around that. I started in Airtight in like 07. But uh, okay. I started doing wireless security when uh, my AP was $300. Yes. So 802.11b. Yep. And then the, each card to connect was 200 mm -hmm. So like just to be able to talk to your own AP, just to replace one wire was 500 bucks. Right. And uh, you had to modify the drivers to even get it to do anything close to monitor mode. And, uh, I mean, that was, you know, 2002, 2003 in there somewhere. Yeah, the hardcore and people were doing it before that. Yeah. And then, it, like, at the time you joined yeah. Airtight, I mean, it was in full swing. Yeah. People were like, oh, my God, we need wireless security. Then I think it kind of, it dropped off. People were like, yeah, wireless security is an interesting, like, yeah. oh, BYOD. I know, and I know it's broken. It's fine. Yeah, BYOD <laughs> and, you know, cyber APTs. Those are big yeah. data. We, you know, we got to jump on a new trend because wireless is old. And cloud. Yeah. Oh, my God, cloud. And <laughs> I think a lot of those kind of bigger issues kind of reached their peak and then dropped off. But yep. um, what, what do you well, think? Did, Go ahead, Mike. Well, didn't the, well, just, I mean, I want to stay on that, but I'm curious your take on it. I would argue too that the wireless got commoditized. I mean, you just said an AP cost three hundred bucks. Yep. That today is like sixty. Uh, you had to have cards. Now it's all built in. So I think when it w when it was a big budget line item, you had to pay attention to it. Now it's a commodity. Right. Everyone Therefore, has it. yep. Oh, and since everyone has it, there can't possibly be anything wrong, right? Something to that effect, unfortunately, is it's so common for people to be using this stuff. I mean, we're all using it all the time, right? And then. Well, what do you mean it's not secure? I mean, this has been out for 15 years. I'm sure it's secure. That's, that's totally the way that works, right? <clears throat> Let me ask a question, though, Rick. I'm, so I'm curious. So, so you, you're interested in how the computers work, and you found very interesting ways to express that. Why wireless? What, what, what brought you to wireless? Why not something else? Oh, um, so honestly, I didn't, I didn't start in wireless. I really started in, in Layer 2 networking. I, I think once I started <laughs> learning the OSI stack, I... Uh, I was just too dumb to go up to layer three, so I stayed around layer two, layer two and a half. Uh, so I worked on the EtherCat project, uh, art poisoning, <clears throat> sniffing on a switch, that kind of stuff. Uh, right after my my university removed all the hubs from their network because I was sniffing on them, so I, I discovered Air, uh, EtherCat and started working on that project. And just, I need another shared medium to <laughs> yeah. apply my yeah. layer two knowledge yeah, so because layer anything two above is that is yeah. So I mean, literally, I started with all the man in the middle on on layer two. And then they started taking that away from me, and I was like, well, okay, so we're going to art poison, we're going to get that back. And they start making that harder and harder, and then it's like, 
hey, Wi-Fi's here. Everything old is new again. Remember all those things that yeah. you should have mm -hmm. fixed, but you bought switches so you didn't have to? Oh, sequence numbers are fine. We don't need to have them, you know, random. And, and even I hey, feel the like the cool we thing is that uh, in IPv6, that was all fixed out of the gate. Oh. oh, that what's IPv6? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, it's not Friday yet. I don't need to know what this is. But it's interesting. <laughs> even uh, like I think wireless security started to taper off on everyone's radar when we introduced WPA2. Yeah. And everyone's like, ah, oh, you know, we don't mm -hmm. have to rely on web or any of these other protocols that are known right. to be insecure anymore. We've got WPA2 now, and it brought the level up enough that it wasn't in the forefront of everyone's brains when you talked about security. I'd say it brought the perceived levels up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but you. except when you Thank go down you. to layer two, that still doesn't matter. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> exactly. Kind of interesting. Um, so, um, let's see. What else do we want to talk about wireless? You built some interesting wireless. I remember you having all kinds of batteries, and you've got various dongles here. I guess... I, I let's do. not go I back in history. Let's talk about dongles. let's talk about your dongles. Let's talk your about current, dongles. your present day dongle. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I've got my latest toy in front of me. Uh, I've been working on this one. This is a a tablet built up to do all of the boning. Um, basically, uh, your your standard Android tablets are wow. Sorry, that's, that's impressive. Uh, your, your standard Android tablet is just a, a Linux device, right? So you can take it, modify the kernel with all your sting, you know your regular packet injection stuff, just like you would. Uh, you know, on your Kali Linux or your Pentu Linux boxes, and you can actually set these things up to do all of the Wi-Fi attacks that you would want. So in this case, we just kind of made little Android lo uh, loaders for them, and nice little menu scripts you can use it on the touch screen. And that's the new Nexus. We talked about the Nexus 7 when I read the... This one's actually not a, a Nexus. Uh, so we, we built <clears throat> up on the Nexus 7, and then they terminated that model and came out with another Nexus 7. Uh, and then they terminated that, that model and came out with a Nexus 9. And they the were... Nine. Uh, right, okay. Let's just say that when we were working on development, the, the Android open source project, when we, you made a clean build from AOSP, it would kernel panic four times before the timer started in the kernel. And we just decided that that was not uh, going to be a good platform for us at that point. So uh, <laughs> we moved over to the NVIDIA Shield platform. Mm -hmm. And these are a little more than double the benchmark scores of anything else we've ever touched. So they're Oh, wait. So this isn't a, a Nexus 9? Right. This is not a Nexus 9. It's just Ooh. a little bit smaller. This is a Shield 8. So okay. a Shield tablet. So these things, I mean, 1080p, all your good stuff. It's fast as sin. It's got a micro SD card with the Nexus line lacks. And, yeah. Uh, oh, no, that's not, yeah, because before you had to play yeah. tricks to get the SD card reader on there. Yep, yeah. exactly. Nice. Yeah, so these have been a lot of fun. This has been the last, I want to say, six weeks of my life. Just kind of redoing all the interfaces, redoing all the menuing, building the, the kernel, building the truth cleanly. So you've got a full working version of Android, so you can still play Flappy Bird, but you've also got all the, uh, the attack tool suite on it. And now, what about your dongle? Ah, so uh, I've actually been working a lot on this stuff. Uh, the the low-level stuff, obviously, is always what interested me. Uh, the, the kernel development, the kernel hacking on, on devices like this. So for a long time, Pony was shipping these uh, TP-Link adapters. And uh, I always thought they were garbage, and then they <laughs> gave me one for free. And I'm like, all right, cool, that's nice. And I plugged it in, and it's like, holy crap, these things are actually really awesome. I don't know how they were found. I mean, they're like the cheapest adapter in the world. These are uh, uh, TP-Link 722Ns. They're $13 each, and uh, they're literally the second best card I've ever tested. Uh, this one's actually got WV stenciled on it because this is part of the Wi-Fi Village crew kit. Mm -hmm. uh, these, we've got like just a box full of these things because they're awesome. Uh, the problem is, is they're 2.4 gigahertz only. I was going to say these are 2.4. Yeah, they're 2.4 only. only. So I've actually got a whole suite of devices that <clears throat> I've been testing recently uh, for dual band support. So uh, devices like this, I just kind of picked up literally every dual band card that had a, uh, a set of RPSMA antennas on it and just kind of started plugging them in and testing them. And uh, it was really great. Uh, I managed to crash my kernel a couple of times, and I managed nice. to find a couple of cards that really work. And this is a Netis WF2151? Yeah, I haven't actually compared this to the other cards yet, but mm -hmm. I've, I've ruled out which ones completely don't work, mm -hmm. and this one's not in that category, okay. so it's, it's definitely a winner so far. And that's a dual band? Yeah, this is a dual band card. Mm -hmm. I uh, tested three new variants from Alpha. Uh, the bright orange one successfully crashed my laptop. Uh, not just crashed, but hard locked up, which on a hardened system is pretty good. Uh, I don't normally see a driver with that much uh, access. So that was, that was awesome. So I'm, I'm in the, the testing phases, but in uh, a week or so, I'm hoping to come out with a nice blog post on the, the Pony Lab site and talk about which one I picked and why, just for as, a, as a thank you to the community for, for reading. And now on, 
in all the Pony Express hardware today, you can choose either 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz wireless cards to sniff on, right? You're looking for the one so, that's dual band. <laughs> so this is actually something different for this model. Um, previously, we went through and we supported just the hardware we sold. Mm -hmm. So we would support this TP-Link adapter, uh, a specific Bluetooth adapter, and those kinds of things. When we went through and built this, We'd, we made a concerted effort to make the hardware support as wide as humanly possible. Mm -hmm. So now it supports pretty much every chipset under the sun that works well in Linux. Okay. So now you literally can use basically anything you find laying around that wasn't made by Broadcom. You're good to go. Uh, all the raw links work. All the Atheros cards work. Um, you know, a couple of other less popular chipsets work as well. It has the wireless driver support in Linux. And I, this is a loaded question. Has <laughs> it gotten better or worse or... Probably worse Ooh. in some areas and, and better in others, right? I always so remember it, being a royal pain in the <laughs> ass it's gotten working a lot with wireless better has for 802.11n. Okay. And then 802.11ac took a step to Bad, like yeah, yeah. horrific levels. Mm -hmm. So the, the drivers in Linux for AC basically just don't sniff at all. Right. Uh, so, I mean, forget, forget packet injection or anything cool. They literally mostly don't even monitor mode correctly. Yeah. Uh, my, my best luck so far is I, I had a, a device made by Rawlink. Uh, media tech now they call it and I, I got it to sniff about six packets per minute mm -hmm. per minute mm. six so it wasn't but good. now n n in the five gigahertz band is not going to pick up all ac stuff in the five because they're five gigahertz but they're in different bands right so so are they i don't the, i shouldn't know the answer the, to this the namings in the the stuff is actually really aggravating when it comes to h11 n h11 n is the outlier so h11 a is 5 gigahertz only. Yep. And then B is 2.4 only. And then G is 2.4 only. But then N works in everything. Yeah, N can be 2.4 It could be five. either, yeah. so you don't know what. And then AC is, is 5 gigahertz only. Okay. And they're in the same chunk of spectrum. Yep. They're just using a different modulation. So, so if you you're have to have an AC compatible card to get the AC traffic, even though it's in the same to band. Get the AC it's a different. Traffic. I gotcha. So you, the management frames, the control frames, mm -hmm. and then some of the slower frames because you're farther away, you can just pick up with a regular N card yep. because they're sent at that compatible speed. Uh, so nothing's really. It's like uh, N, I right? See. When N came out, people were like, oh, it's 300 megabits. My 54 megabit card will never see it. Well, no. No, you can still see it. Mm -hmm. You can still see more than enough of it that it's not like invisible. There's right. no the, the the whole green. You can see field. The, the AP beaconing. That's why yeah, even you can if see the your AP radio beaconing. may have an A radio yeah. in it, but since it's five gigahertz, it sees it A right. beaconing. What you can't. You yeah, can't you can see it. the beacons from the AP. You can see the probes mm -hmm. from the clients. You can see the control frames, things like that, to keep it from colliding with the lower technologies. Mm -hmm. You're gonna see a lot of traffic, so it still works. It's just not as good. So right now we're doing you know a lot of AC sniffing using just the the five G cards. Yep. But I'm hoping that in the next couple of months the the drivers will finally catch up because I mean it's it's basically required for a lot of functions in Linux. Well, and you still need all this hardware when you go yeah. do your pen test, right? I yeah. mean because you got to have your two point four gigahertz card. Yeah. You got to have it two one for N and one for AC mm -hmm. if you're going to do the full spectrum oh, of yeah. testing. Absolutely. Yeah. There's there's a lot of hardware you need for for a good wireless assessment. Right. Yeah, and actually, this this is just talking about Wi-Fi, right? And if we're talking about a wireless assessment, now you can plug in your your RTL SDR or your Hack RF or your Blade RF into these yes. devices. You can start running, you know, the Bluetooth scans with the mm -hmm. UberTooth and the I mean, all all manner of stuff that makes up the wireless assessments. It really, especially with the SDR world, really actually coming out with things that work these days. Mm -hmm. Like you can actually do some really fun stuff. Uh, I broke into my office by convincing it that the door was actually still closed when I opened it. That's that's pretty funny. Nice. You nice. know what? Let's stand up for a second because that, that's <laughs> that's an interesting point. Well, not 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 to that specifically, but you know, it's interesting because I think that until you pointed it out, when you say wireless assessment, I instantly just thought, oh, okay, it's it's eight hundred yeah. eleven. But but now, as soon as you said it, you know, I, I looked at local businesses; they're using Bluetooth for all sorts of stuff. Yep. There's RF all over the place. Uh, I know people that have, you know, wireless cell phone boosters and stuff like that. Yep. So are you, what, would we be surprised or what would surprise us when you go in and you do a full spectrum wireless test or a wireless assessment of an organization, what are you finding the most that surprises, uh, maybe it doesn't surprise you <laughs> anymore, but what would surprise us? Oh gosh. Uh, it's, it's really amazing what's wireless that people didn't even know they had. Um, <laughs> uh, when I was working for, for Airtype, my, my primary concern was, was federal government. And I would go to all of these places that were completely no wireless environments. You're not supposed to have anything. 
And um, in all of my tenure, I never found anywhere that was no wireless for more than about 45 minutes at a time. I mean, like I might get there and there was no wireless, but within the first 45 minutes, something would show up that shouldn't show up. And it, it's really shocking um, how many things are shortcutted to use wireless instead of just bothering to run the wire or how many things have wireless turned on that you can't even turn off. Uh, for mm -hmm. instance, I just had to RMA my, my thermostat for my house. I did not have a fancy Nest thermostat because I don't want my thermostat to be hacked. So I, I had a, a nice standard smart thermostat. Hey, that I my thermostat's secure because it uses the cloud. I, I'm sure it. I'm, yes, that's, that's how that works. So uh, I, I had RMA because it was broken. And they're like, you know, we don't make your model anymore. Here's the Wi-Fi model. And I said, oh, I really don't want this, but I can just turn it off. So I went into the menu and you can't turn it off. And then I went, okay, you know, at least if it's connected to my network, that's a little bit safer, right? It's connected mm. to something can't be as easily fished. And I go to type in my passphrase, and it cuts me off after 32 characters. Like, no, that's, that's all you're allowed to type. And they, they Literally, they make these devices to be quick and easy to use, and they don't really think about security at all. So from the, the glass break alarms in the house to the, the wireless sensors for your security system that are going to tell you when the doors open and close... They're all made by wireless, but instead of following like any sane protocol, they normally just do really, really simple stuff. Like I'm going to say a one and my serial number means I'm open, a two and my serial number means I'm closed, a three means I'm in error state. And it's like so SNMP. It, all it, over. It's, yeah. yeah, it is incredibly simple, simple stuff. Uh, normally uh, AFSK or, or OOK, just really, really simple on-off keying, just a blip, 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 blip kind of stuff. It's really easy to decode. It's really easy to just play back. And that's, that's basically what I was doing with the security system at the office was I, I recorded the door being opened, and then I recorded the door being closed. And then I just kind of played that at high speed, and the little ready light on the panel just went blink, 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 blink. So you couldn't arm the system. So what it would say is, you know, clearly your door sensor is broken. Just bypass it and arm the security system. So you could arm the security system as long as that door doesn't work, and you can just walk right back through the door. So... Uh, Wow. It's, it's, all, it's all made for ease of use. So rather than saying you can't arm the system, obviously, you know, having all of your sensors except one working is better, right? You wouldn't want them to not be able to go home that night. So you just bypass what doesn't work and just keep going. You know, handy menus on the screen for how to bypass all of your security and just walk right out yeah, the door. Yeah, it's that, it's that fail secure concept we used to play with. Yeah, yeah. Well, you have to fail open. It's the only way I get to go home on time. Yep. Yep, that's interesting. So do you find then that can, there's a certain, I mean, we see more and more consumer grade stuff is being used in the enterprise. And are you finding that then with the wireless? Absolutely. Full spectrum wireless? A absolutely. It's there's there's all kinds of things that would be considered consumer grade that have been moved into the enterprise because, well, they're so easy to use. And I use this at home. I don't see why I can't use it at the office. Even even things as simple as like the wireless headsets that people use to talk on the phone, you get these things, they're 900 megahertz. They're basically a narrow yep. band FM transmitter, and you can just sit outside the support center as they're resetting everybody's password, listen to them give the username, listen to them give the password. Now, now Apple One's not a good password. You need to change this right away, and you're like, okay, no problem. We'll change that real quick. And it's, it's, yeah. it's really amazing the level of technology. You think about these corporations. Well, I have WPA2. I have you know, uh, authentication through certificates, and my security force is using an unencrypted narrow band FM radio on an open frequency. And, you know, 30 seconds into the engagement, you know exactly where everybody is, when they're going to be there, when their wow. shifts end. I mean, yeah. the, doing a wireless assessment where you just do Wi-Fi is, is really a cop-out. It's very it, limiting. Yeah, you're not, you're not doing all of the well, job, like and it's saying, harder. Like we were saying before, <laughs> Wi-Fi equipment was really expensive back in the day, yeah. and that cost has come, come down. But I think also what we've seen is this very specific wireless technologies at one time, they may have been pretty expensive. Oh, yeah. But now the cost of those have come down as well. Absolutely. So all of these companies, vendors, manufacturers are saying, well, now I can buy millions of those from China and I can implement my software on them. And hey, look, this is great. It's all wireless now. Alarm yep. companies, whatever product that you're making, absolutely. I guess the point is, can have some kind of wireless technology in it now, really cheaply. Whereas ten years ago, that wasn't the case, and that's yep. where we are seeing. You're questioning, Mike, is along the right lines. Is that wireless is no longer just Wi-Fi anymore? It's all of these different spectrums and bands and technologies that are all now low-hanging fruit because they're all implementing some kind of wireless because it's cheap now. Yeah, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear feedback from, from the folks that participate in the show uh, when they get to see this. How many, when they are looking at pen tests 
for their organizations and how many when they're doing these reviews and they're writing their policies have expanded that because I'm guessing the number is not very high. Yeah, we actually do that for the Wireless Village. So uh, I'm, I'm part of the crew that does the Wireless Village at DEF CON. And then we do maybe 12 or 13 other conventions every year where we do what we call a wireless capture the flag. But instead of doing puzzles and games and solve this challenges, we basically just set up real life stuff. We set up your, your WPA access points, we set up your WEP access points, but we also set up actual things Excuse that we've me. pulled out of some of our customers beer. from our engagements. So like we'll go and we'll buy a, a GSM bug off of you know some website or we'll buy a listening device that does FM transmission off of some website and we'll set that stuff up and like we literally sat all year at DEF CON last year with a wireless bug sitting in between myself and the other gentleman running the capture the flag and we just sat there with it and it was just recording us playing it out into an unencrypted FM stream not a single contestant cracked that one. Wow. Like, they could have just listened to us as we chatter, you know, like, hey, is this That's working? Funny. Oh, let's, let's log in. Let's see what's going on. We were just spilling all kinds of information, and not one person cracked the bug because nobody does a, a TSCM sweep like that. Nobody does technical countermeasures anymore. And we, we really want to see that move from government-only kind of a thing Ooh. to a, you know, I mean, if you're a high-value asset, if you're doing a multi-million dollar deal or something, this this is a legitimate concern for you. These things cost, like, five dollars on yeah. on wood or whatever you know it's, it's cheap so what's the what's the cost for the countermeasure the, the, the cost the, for the, the countermeasure is the tech, yeah. it's mostly skill honestly and that's that's what we're trying to build the the wireless village and especially the wireless capture the flag are very well focused on education we want to get you guys exposed to these kinds of technologies to how you actually sweep for bugs i mean to so friggin' James Bond stuff, man. It's just yeah, way more it's like fun. Spy movie shit, it's yeah. spy movie shit that we're doing, really. Well, so like, uh, yeah, well, you know, this is the thing. <laughs> you know, a number of years ago, we still and and I don't want to go deep into passwords today, but we we talk about passwords and we talk about people. Nobody understands passwords. If you stand in front of a group of people and say, "How many of you want to know how how passwords work?" People go, "No, no, no thanks." Yeah. How many of you want to know how to break passwords? Shoop, everybody's hand goes up and they'll pay attention. And and what you're describing is feels very much like how many of you would like to know how to sweep for bugs? Uh, I'm in. Teach me. Yeah. So that's, that's freaking odd. Like, I'm, you have my full attention. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. We find that, uh, I mean, the, the Wi-Fi stuff, honestly, is, is played out. Most of us that have been in the industry for any amount of time know the problems. They're still there. And no matter how many times we use the same thing to exploit them, people just don't care. So, I mean, you Paul go... Paul tells us about it every week, right? D-Link has a, has a problem every week we talk about it. Yeah, yep. I mean, literally, you take, you take my phone... You plug in your dongle, you go, you put it in your pocket, you stand in the smoking area running an evil access point, and what do people do? They come out of the office, they turn on their phone, they go to Facebook, they type in their passwords, all their stuff, and they're running through my access point, and then I just grabbed everything I need from the engagement, and I can just waltz right back in the door through the nice you know, smoker who held it for me. So, I mean, you get physical access, you get your first set of passwords before you even walk in the door, and it's a great day, right? And honestly, that's great, and you still win. Winning's good. But it's 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 lost its appeal. Uh, the the Jason Bourne stuff is just way more fun. So we, yeah. we started playing around with that stuff. You know how to hack security systems, how to get past this sensor, how to you know open your garage door in thirty seconds or less. Uh, thank you, Sammy. Uh, you just yeah. you're bored. Here are these these things that they have no rolling code. They have you know x number of possibilities, and he <clears throat> finds a way to jam on it in like thirty seven seconds. You press one button, and every garage door in the neighborhood opens. I think it's fun. You know, it's interesting too. This to me feels like stuff I would do with my kids. And, it is. And in the process, it's going to force me to learn how to code, which I lament, but I'll do it. <laughs> but it's but it but but now I gave them a reason. And if we if we get involved in the security side and start teaching it, then we can we can avoid some of these problems we keep talking about every week. We could say, no, no, here here's a smarter way to do it. Here, let me show you how to do X. How would you build something to defeat this or whatever? I mean, no, I'm. I'm seriously interested. I mean, like, you know, someday we'll meet. Uh, one day I'll actually venture to the studio. But, but until then, this is... But there, I, there was a time... I mean, go, let's go back in time to security conferences, right? And... Um, back before there were two a day? G, GSM, <laughs> GSM, CDMA. I mean, yep. we were using that stuff instead of using Wi-Fi. Right. We didn't necessarily think that we were completely safe. I don't think... At least I never thought I was completely yeah. safe. But I always thought I was safer using those even early technologies. And it now was you just really, turn it off. Really freaking <laughs> slow, right? Yeah. But now when I go to a conference, I'm like, 
I don't, my, my sailor, you know, I've seen all the talks that started cropping up at conferences about empty <laughs> catchers and all this stuff. And I'm like, yeah. this is no longer safe. I think it's still safer. But now today, well, so there's, there's actually maybe an not. interesting story because, I mean, we met at ShmooCon. Yeah. But uh, you, you missed this year. And uh, this year we, uh, well, we, we were setting up our, our little game and things were actually running smoothly for a change, which is really nice for us. Uh, we, we've actually gotten good enough at running it that, that I don't have to sit there typing the whole time to keep it working. So we were goofing off. I got to go to a couple of talks, and, and one of the talks I noticed my phone was acting a little weird. So I, I opened up my, my phone, and it said I was in Vegas. Uh, not, not just I was in Vegas. I was, I was at, um, uh, what, what hotel was the, was Black Hat in? Uh, Mandalay, Mandalay Bay. Bay. said I was at Mandalay Bay. And I'm like, you know, that's, that's not right. And so I, I go to turn off my Wi-Fi thinking I, I'm on a Wi-Fi connection, and, and the Wi-Fi's off. And I'm like, no, no, wait, no, that, that's wait why why does it think i'm at mandalay bay and so i open up the the little app i've got that tells me what cell phone network i'm connected to and there's one where the location code doesn't match all the rest of them and that's the one i'm connected to so uh i went back to get the rest of the wireless village team uh we left like one poor dude guarding our stuff and we all came out with like all of the toys uh one guy um has a special job we won't talk about, and, and the other two sweep TSEM for a living. So we just kind of started wandering around. It's like, okay, so that guy's plugged into the wall. That guy's plugged into the wall. He's twitching every time I walk by, and we're, like, just trying to shield the antennas we're pointing around. We literally, we found somebody at the conference running a successful fake cell phone network. Mm -hmm. Wow. And quite, quite impressive, to be honest. But, I mean, the... The requirement to do that is quite low. So, I mean, uh, Chris Pageant did it yeah. years and years ago I saw that at DEF CON. Well, he was at ShmooCon. Yeah, ShmooCon, and then I first. think DEF CON. Yeah. yeah. So, it, a couple of times. So, it's not like new thing, but at mm. the time, it was like ten grand worth of gear. It was expensive. Ample. It was oh, the yeah. same thing. It was expensive. Very expensive. And, then, yeah. and now, you can just run a fake cell phone network on a Blade RF, which is mm -hmm. about $400, mm -hmm. $500 for the good one. You can just plug this thing into your, your computer, download like an open BTS distro. Mm -hmm. I've got it in Pentu as well. You can just run Yate BTS. BTS, which is uh, the the rewrite that's meant more for Blade RF kind of hardware. Mm -hmm. So it'll it'll support the cheap USRPs. It'll support the the slightly uh, nicer USRPs, and then it'll support the Blade RF, which is kind of in the middle of those products. Um, and you can run a, a full cell network. Mm -hmm. uh, they've got two 2.5 and 3G working, and they're working on 4G. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's it's really a low bar anymore to actually run your own cell network. To do it, that's exactly We're right back to that evil AP. Right, we're right back Thank to you so AP. much for raising yeah. my confidence tonight. Yeah. I feel, yeah. Yeah, I, feel I, I remember the first right time that uh, <laughs> I had something suspicious at uh, DEF CON a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And I was like, it says I'm connected to Sprint, but it says I have a good signal. I'm turning my phone <laughs> off. <laughs> <laughs> that's what they forgot when they right. did the... Like, yeah. If you're going to do oh, Sprint, no, no, you got to no. give it crappy yeah. service. Oh, no. Power button. Yep. Power down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, that, and that, that's exactly it. Is the <laughs> bar has become so low. So, it, again, I mean, it used to be really expensive to do Wi-Fi, yep. and then it got a lot cheaper, and then people started doing awful things. And now we're honestly at that point with cellular where so much of the network still relies on the fact that, like, there's older technology and you have mm -hmm. to be compatible, and everyone has to be able to make a 911 call. It doesn't matter what it is. So, I mean, like, the tower has to support encryption, but, you know, sometimes those modules break. Mm -hmm. People need to be able to use their phone still, so, you know, we'll just run it with no encryption for a week or two or three while we get the new board in. So, I mean, you can actually find these, you know, 3G and 4G towers that are, that are open, essentially. Well, yeah, and, and for fair, right, if, if we did a standard risk assessment, it's fair risk. Ab absolutely, and that, that's exactly what people think. So now as the hardware gets cheaper, you end up with these evil twin cell yeah, phone yeah, towers yeah. instead of evil twin Wi-Fi devices. The difference is, is oh. we're, we're at the same point with cellular stuff as we, are, as we were with Wi-Fi years and years ago. Is It's, it's $100,000 if you want to do cellular research, and it's, it was the same deal with, with Wi-Fi. To, to get something that did monitor mode in the first days was nearly impossible, yeah. and now everything does it. The difference with cellular here is, though, it's completely federally illegal to monitor unless you are law enforcement. So it's still illegal to set up the IMSI catchers? Uh, it's illegal to sniff baseband. Okay. You can set up an IMSI catcher, but you can't sniff to see all the unencrypted data. I gotcha. So the, essentially the, the laws in the U.S., uh, give or take, you, you can look it up on the FCC website. They're very proud of their, their lawful intercept and their, their what you're allowed to monitor laws. Um, you can monitor absolutely anything you want as long as it doesn't belong to a telco. I gotcha. So you, can't, you can monitor restaurant pagers, but you can't monitor 
pagers from a telco. Mm -hmm. You can't monitor cell phones, but you can monitor cordless phones. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's anything owned by the Selco it just gets this magical protection bubble around it. Mm -hmm. So you're not actually allowed to just sniff on well, those Well, it is a magical protection it bubble is. because it anyone who wants to break the law can burst it, the bubble. Exactly, right? yeah. exactly. As long as you are law-abiding, you can't do it. And so if you were to do this research, mm -hmm. which I'm not saying anybody in the right mind would do, you find something awful, your options are prove that I violated federal law and tell somebody mm -hmm. or just kind of keep it under my hat and it yeah. benefits it's, no it one. It goes back to our disclosure debate, yeah. right? If you do find something well, in this case, you have again. to admit that you're... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not only do you have the disclosure issues, but you have the I violated federal law thing on top of yeah, it. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Your, exactly. your likelihood of you actually disclosing any of those vulnerabilities is pretty nil. Hey, it's yeah. not that scary unless you violate DMCA too. Oh. <laughs> this yeah. is true. So Which I, probably, if you're decrypting something... If you're you're Decrypting, you probably, yeah, probably are, are. You're probably yeah. violating CFAA plus DMCA plus. But that's like FCC, why you know. that's why a lot of it's been swept under the rug, and it's not yeah. a big on anyone's radar, right. Because in order People to do the research, it. it's kind of an esoteric yeah. kind of thing because there are all these laws involved, and technically well, you shouldn't would, be doing so it. So only yeah. yeah. So the oh God, forgive me for so the drink, researchers. Jack. So the researchers publicly researching for the public good um, are are not actually doing this. And anybody that's sort right. of tempted knows better than to talk about it. Mm -hmm. So the only people playing with this are law enforcement and criminals. Yep. And, on the nose. And, on the nose. That's and, exactly it. And the and criminals, the and the criminals share their information about stingrays more than law enforcement. You betcha. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, I mean, building your own IMSI catcher is not really a big deal. You can set something like that up with Blade RF uh, off a live CD in a few minutes. Um, so I kind of... I looked at how those laws work and, and what you're not allowed to do and what you are allowed to do. And you're essentially allowed to do basically nothing. So I, I decided to think back about like how Wi-Fi used to work when you didn't have all those fun toys. So before there was monitor mode and Kismet, what was there? Uh, your own card that you configured to do <laughs> Your own something. card that yeah. spit probes out constantly right. and read back to you what it found. So you had NetStumbler. Mm -hmm. You had yeah. Wi-Fi yeah. stumblers. Non-monitor mode. Yeah, non-monitor yeah. mode garbage that told you what was in the immediate area and signal strengths and encryption levels. Yeah. Semi-useful stuff, not nearly as good as seeing data. But I thought, you know, that was just kind of supported on every Wi-Fi card. Mm hmm Something like that is very, very similar to the way cell phones work. Yeah. You had this, like, why didn't I think of that moment? Yeah, exactly. You were like, well, why can't we just detect the IMSI catchers? And yep. I'm like, duh, why didn't we think of that sooner? Like, that's yep. awesome. You know, we don't necessarily need to violate federal law in order right. to accomplish that someone, like you said at the conference, someone's intercepting the cellular technology. Right, exactly. So what, what I went and I did and I said, okay, so what are the standard features of like a cell phone or a 4G dongle? It's going to be able to look for carriers. Mm -hmm. It's going to be able to identify and connect to towers. It's going to see their location code, their cell ID, uh, signal strength, whether there's encryption or not. All these basic things you need to be able to make a connection. And you can identify those perfectly legally in a report. Right, because that's what your cell phone literally is doing, doing all yeah. the time. That, yeah. That's how you just the made device. a more intelligent cell phone that right. reported on all of this. I, I actually made a dumber one. It'll try to connect to things no matter how bad the signal strength is. Uh, I literally made it dumber. I see. Uh, so I basically I, I set up a, a Wi-Fi card. Sorry, I set up a, a cellular card, a mm -hmm. 4G unlocked dongle, to scan for carriers, mm -hmm. and then I forcibly try to associate to every single carrier in every single conceivable mode, and if they hit, I record all the information I get, do a couple mm -hmm. of tests, and then move on to the next one. So I literally just kind of built a cellular stumbler yep. that goes through, identifies things, can catch changes. You know, all of a sudden, I've got a location ID that doesn't match anything else in the area. I was going to say, how that's, do you differentiate? That's, weird. that's how you differentiate the real yeah. tower from a yep. fake one. So the one. location area code will change, or the cell ID will change, mm -hmm. or the signal strength will wildly change. Mm -hmm. If you believe it, this really expensive gear on the tower does not change the signal strength that much during the day. I got like, you. Just, it yeah. just doesn't happen. So you can see a wild change in signal strength, like... Why did that tower just get closer to me and then farther away? Yeah, either they're walking around <laughs> or their gear just isn't sensitive yeah. enough to maintain signal exactly. strength for that long. Exactly. Gotcha. So you can, you can account for a lot of the normal stuff pretty easily. Mm. And so I basically built a, a cellular stumbler, essentially. And that's, that's what we were debuting at, at RSA this year yeah. is, is how to detect. And, and, and the goal was, was twofold for this project, and I want that to be very clear. I mean, yes, I can absolutely detect an IMSI catcher run by some dude with a Blade RF or a USRP. Mm-hmm. Can I detect the one that the feds are using? I yeah. have no idea. 
I haven't had the opportunity to test. If there are any feds listening, yeah. I'd love hey, a you chance. Want, hey, you Can want to I come down to the lab? Can I borrow Stingray yeah. for a little bit? That would be great. Mm -hmm. uh, just, borrow. I'll give it back. You need the air I'll quotes. give it back. Uh, no, I'll give it back when I'm done with it. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, I, I haven't had a chance to test it on anything that I didn't set up personally. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you can test it with microcells, uh, femtocells. You can test it with all the crap that the Blade RF can do. Uh, and that's, that's quite a bit. So I managed to, to very accurately pinpoint a bunch of things that's like, I see that in the air, and like I don't like that at all. Mm -hmm. And just basically wrote an alerts engine to find things like simple stuff. The, wow. the cell ID changed, the, the lack's wrong, the signal strength's wildly fluctuating. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't seen anything for a few minutes. There's probably somebody jamming. Uh, I gotcha. A few of the cards actually have jammer detection built in, which mm -hmm. is really cool. Um, a lot of them don't, so I tried to, to write this as generically as possible, and I was, was looking at it because... Every card's a little bit different, and I was trying to, to go for wide support. So that, that's that's something I've been working on in in, in my uh, research and development role at Pony. That's actually the the bulk of the work I have done. Uh, the the Pony pad's a, a labor of love. Uh, I, I just love this product line and playing with this stuff. But the the cell stuff is really uh, what I mostly was tasked with since I joined, and it's been a difficult run. But it, it's uh, I've learned a lot by reading about 8,000 pages of Huawei manuals, mm -hmm. uh, and that is don't ever read 8,000 pages of Huawei manuals. Uh, it's actually easier to just throw commands at the card and, and wait see for what it one does. to stick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I literally, I, if, before I wrote oh, the cell phone stumbler. Oh, because Huawei makes the 4G dongle. Yeah, they, yeah, they make yeah. the 4G dongle. So before I successfully wrote the cell stumbler, I wrote an AT command stumbler, where it was basically just throwing every conceivable AT command at the modem, recording what it did, and then I'd go on to the next one until I found one that didn't suck so badly. Mm -hmm. Uh, they don't follow their own manuals. They don't implement their own vendor-specific <laughs> sets. I know, right? How, how could that possibly have happened? That's, uh, that's so now this is all of. supported on the Pony Express software? Right. This is all supported on the Pony Express software. Uh, we're, we're offering it to our beta customers right now because it's, it's very much a, a work in progress. Mm -hmm. But it definitely sees some really entertaining stuff. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, a couple of weeks from now, I'm going to be deploying it in some... Um, We'll go with more interesting areas than, yeah. than my lab in, in Pittsburgh. Yeah, I can see it being very interesting. If you're a corporation, you've got multiple locations. Can yes. you deploy this? Like, yes. Th you've never looked at this before. No one's looked at this before. Exactly. That's really cool. Well, I shouldn't say no one. Very few have probably thought to look in this yeah. way. So. And, that, and that goes back to the all-spectrum stuff. I mean, you're looking at Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, mm -hmm. Zigbee, you know, all the 802.11, 802.15.4 uh, 802 variants, all the 802.11 variants, you know, the, the cell phones, the the radios that the, the security guys carry around and you know people rely so heavily on cellular even even in our own company we have a hard rule you're not allowed to use wi-fi if you're not someplace secure like your home your office mm -hmm. whatever like you go to a hotel you have to use 4g and then here i am like spinning up mz catchers and stuff in my house and like well maybe that maybe we should just you know just leave the laptop at home yeah. just, just give up <laughs> just, just, give just, up. just call it a day don't use it anymore. Pad of paper is all you really need. Jack's familiar. Yes. You, can, <laughs> oh. you can identify all of the Pony Express employees uh, when they're working remotely because they've got a big satellite dish strapped <laughs> yeah. to their back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which actually, that, that, got broken, that, that got, got broken, broken before too. 4G. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They got a really long wire attached to them. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, they, they got a big wire. Yeah. Yeah. Big wire. Well, so let me, let me ask the a question then. Now, now that we've terrified the hell out of everybody... Is there one thing we can do that dramatically improves our wireless security? We, like indi oh, as individuals. God. Turn Stop. it off. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, often, I often ask before I do a presentation, like, okay, do you want your people to be able to sleep at night so <laughs> I know, like, how far down the rat hole to take them? But the, the truth of the matter is, is you really have to be aware of what's going on before you can be secure. Um, a lot of devices... Yeah. Everything old is new again every time there's new technology. I mean, the, the, all the things you could do on a hub that you could no longer do on a switch that you can now do in Wi-Fi, and exactly the same happens with every single wireless technology that comes out, is it's like, well, we solved this problem 30 years ago, but I'm not going to learn anything from that. I'm just going to re-implement it from scratch because, you know, anybody can do encryption. It's not that hard. You know, just XOR the key in RC4, it's fine. Um, so what you really need to do is, is actually learn what looks right and what looks wrong. So the, a lot of mobile devices, uh, Android Pre 4, uh, I, uh, Android Pre uh, Ice Cream Sandwich, uh, and then like a lot of iOS devices will actually connect to an unencrypted network with the same name as your encrypted network because obviously you must have reset the encryption and I wouldn't want my users to not be able to connect. So right. you know the name matches, just go ahead and connect. 
And the devices will just do this. So even if you're configured to never connect to anything that isn't secure, never connect to anything you don't know, it'll still just magically connect to an unencrypted access point because the name matches. So you really have to get used to looking at, like, the little bubble pops up and it says, you've been connected to a new network, in parentheses, unsecured. You need to actually look it, at that stuff. Oh, God. The, it's the one that drives me nuts on, on Android, uh, the the connection optimizing software oh, God. where you turn off your wireless and then it says you you know you you pop into Starbucks and it says you've connected to Starbucks Google it's like I turned you oh yep. forgot to turn the optimizer off <laughs> oh yeah but, but, you know but it is fun. there are some tools like for wireless I travel with a wireless firewall you know that it, it connects and then you're behind NAT until you right. do a VPN and then the VPN won't connect if they're if they're screwing with the certs um, which is good because it's fun to really screw with people. Like I have a little tiny one that just converts wireless <laughs> to RJ45. Yes. Right. And yes. Uh, somebody asked me what I was sound clip somewhere. Uh, somebody asked me what I was doing. It's oh company policy. We're not allowed to use wireless. So I do this. Yep. And the and it was like oh okay. And then you could see the gear is rolling. It's like wait a minute. <laughs> so I, I, have, I have two stories off of that one. And again at Schmookon this year, I I can't remember the gentleman's name. And I apologize. You gave an awesome talk, and I totally forget who you are. Uh, he made a gumsticks computer, a little USB Linux computer, into a wireless firewall. So basically, you plug in this heaping monstrosity into your USB port. It pretends to be CDC Ethernet. So you get Ethernet, and then you go into a little web interface, connect it to the wireless right. for you, just, just like what you're describing. And I thought that was so awesome. You know, Android actually has the same feature. When you do USB tethering, yeah. it'll offer an Ethernet interface to the computer. So I, I actually added to the PwnPad 3 software uh, the ability to tether, hook up to a device, and attack it from there. Nice. So you can so like you'll have your firewall set up and everything, but you, this interface is new. You've never seen it before. So you plug into a device through USB, and then you just kind of start throwing scans at it or offer it internet through you to oh, try to redirect the traffic. Can I charge my phone off your laptop? Uh, you wouldn't believe how it. often the answer to that is yes. I love it. Because well, people too naturally much. want to help people. Most <laughs> right. People, people want to be polite. Yeah. And I always offer those people a USB condom to cut their yes. data wires when they connect yes. to me. Yes. Like, yes, you can charge. Here's my USB battery pack. Right. Stay away from right. my laptop. Yeah. <laughs> so, Rick, what, what's coming next for uh, Pony Express Labs? Oh, man. Uh, so we've actually spent a lot of time doing all these cool projects. And, you know, th the general purpose of, of the community edition of everything is really just to get where we came from to get the fruits of our labor, right? We work on things like the Pwn Pads and whatnot, and it's, it's mostly open source software. It's Android with a Kali Linux trude on it, and then a bunch of toys and tools. And, you know, it's, it's the vast majority is open software and some really awesome scripting by me. No, actually, it's really bad scripting by me, really good testing by Kevin, and then <laughs> slightly better scripts coming out of me. Uh, so, I mean, we, we work on that stuff, and we, we like to get it back into the community. So part of my role is actually... Uh, reaching out to the community, doing the activate, uh, get, getting people involved in what we do, even if it's just giving them free stuff. Like, this is where we came from. This is what we love. I can't count the number of hacker conferences I've been to anymore, but it's too many for my wife to be happy with it. And so, so we're, we're actually relaunching uh, Labs as, as a thing for Pony Express as a community outreach. So we've got uh, labs.ponyexpress.com, where we've just relaunched it this week. I uh, got a sweet new logo. You guys got a, a hint of the logo when Paul showed you my tablet. We uh, basically have the unicorn logo from Pony Express now. So uh, didn't want to really ruin the branding, but uh, we thought we were doing something special, so we decided to have a unicorn logo. I like it. I like yeah, it. I, I really it like works. it, too. I, I think it's great. We, we tried it out with the rainbow horn, but uh, we, we got that shot down by the, the mm. PR people. So uh, it doesn't get the rainbow horn, but it still gets the job done. I really like it. So uh, we've just launched the labs.ponyexpress.com page, and we've got you know, new additions, uh, new community editions coming out soon. Uh, I've got a concerted effort going on to release not just the, the binaries, because that's releasing free software, right? I mean, I give you a tarball that has everything, have a great time with it. That's, that's what they call free software. I'm not charging you for it. What I want to release is open source software. I want a full build system release, everything, 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 so you can run our build scripts to generate everything for yourself. So you can actually port this from a Nexus or from an NVIDIA to, to something. A something else. Because I get people asking me that all the time. It's like, oh, would you like to support a Samsung or this, that, or God, the other there's thing? There's so much like, hardware out there to play around there's with, There's so yeah. much hardware, and I can only play with so and much. And it changes so fast. Like, Every day. Even doing yeah. some of the research for my class, I loved these devices that NetGate used to sell. Mm -hmm. um, they were the, what were they called? They rebranded it. It's actually like a NetGate brand now. Um, and oh, it's geez. releasing in July. 
Oh, I, nice. I can tell you what it is. Um, but I'm like, that wasn't... When did that come about? <laughs> It's right. Just, it's yeah, just new really stuff all the time, and and especially with Android, it's all it's all rumor mill BS until they actually release it. So it's like, oh, this phone, it's going to replace your car, your house, and your supercomputer all at once. It can fly, and then it comes out, and it's like it's got a two forty by three twenty screen and eight megs of yeah. RAM. Like, it's amazing. Yeah, PC <laughs> engines used to make these boards, and now they're actually Netgate branded boards. Nice. Just to show you how technology. Like, yeah. And they've got these mini ones called a mini mini minnow board and yep. a beagle bone. Uh, beagle bones are awesome. Yeah. Beagle have you played bones with those are great. Before? Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah they just popped up on their good. website. I haven't played around with those yet. So. Yeah. So I, I do a lot of yeah. embedded work, and I. I find hardware that I like, and then other people find other hardware that they like. And like where I would think something's a piece of junk and it's throwaway, somebody it's, else has got a low got a, enough thing that it's like, this is perfect for me. They find a usage for it. Right. So releasing the build system, releasing everything we do so that you can just go and spit it out and replicate it somewhere else is, is something I've got a lot of passion in because I, everything I've ever done is open source. And I, I really like to keep that up. So I, I've been working on getting all that out. So that's, that's what's next is giving more free stuff to the community and... And hoping that somebody enjoys it. Excellent. And you can find all that at labs.ponyexpress.com. Thanks to our special guest, Rick. And with that, we're going to take a short break, come back, and talk about stories for this week. So stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> 